What are you going to do? Start. Start. All right. Um, what's going on, everybody? My name is Jacob Lynn. I am from Team 7068 from St. Francis High School in St. Francis, Minnesota. And I am going to be presenting on um, uh, pneumatics today. So uh, let's get started. Okay, so these are the things that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about pneumatics concepts, why we use pneumatics. We're going to talk about the limitations of pneumatics. Um, we're going to talk about um, all the components associated with pneumatics and then pneumatic mechanisms. So uh, can everyone answer in the chat? Is this your first year in FRC robotics and does your team use pneumatics this year? Are you seeing the chat, Jake? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, I'm not seeing chat here. Hmm. You have to click at the bottom, like there's a bar that opens up and you can click on the chat and it should pop up in a separate window. As long as you can. So what's the spread here? This is a lot. You guys can also, uh, Turn your mic on and speak would be great too. We can interact as well. This is kind of gauge the audience here and see if how many people have used the uh, the a pneumatics. Or right, I got the chat up now too. First year, okay. Yeah. So Karen, did you guys even build a robot last year? Well, yeah, we did. Um, we were pretty close to having it ready for competition. Um, we, we pretty much just had the ball intake, ball carrier, ball shooting. We didn't do anything with the climb or the, um, the, the vision kind of spinning the thing, but we were pretty close. It's great. It's good to see you guys on here and then make sure you share the videos with your team then. I don't know if you guys are meeting or not, but it's a good way to recap all the sessions we've had the last uh, two weeks of doing this and then this week. So good. So, if we, um, so a lot of you have not been using pneumatics. So let's go on, Jake, and uh, go on what we're going to present to here. All right. Okay. So pneumatics is can be kind of compared to the electrical system. So if you're familiar with that, I guess this will help you further understand pneumatics. So in electrical, voltage is kind of like our, is kind of like the pressure in pneumatics. It's kind of like the air pressure. It's what's forcing the air through the, through the tubing, right? Voltage pushes electrons through a wire. It's kind of that driving force. So pressure can kind of be compared to voltage in this case. Um, and like I said, current is the flow of electrons. Well, in this case, air is flowing through your pneumatic system. So air flowing can kind of be compared to current in this situation. Um, storage can be compared to capacitance. So in electronics, capacitors are able to store an electric charge. Well, your storage system in uh, pneumatics is basically a storage container that stores air pressure. Um, which is very similar to electronics. Um, restrictions, that can be compared to resistance. So, you know, if you have a really thin piece of tubing, right, it's not going to be able to pass as much air through, right? So electricity well, with resistance can be kind of compared to uh, pneumatic restriction in that way. Uh, valves and switches are very similar, where switches can switch on and off the flow of electric current valves can switch on and off the flow of air to your cylinders or whatever you're using. Um, and then cylinders can be compared to linear motors. So if you have like a rack and pinion kind of a situation. So if you had a gear on a rack and it would slide the rack back and forth, a cylinder is very similar to that. It gives you just straight linear motion. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about why we use pneumatics. So 
pneumatics provides a powerful and reliable linear motion. It's very, it's just, it's just a, a cylinder. It's all the way out or all the way in. It's very, very powerful. You can lift or pull very, a lot of weight. So you, you can actually like pull your whole robot up if you wanted to, if you had a big enough cylinder. Uh, it can actually save weight if many cylinders are used. So we'll touch on that a little bit more on why you might want to go all pneumatics or all motors. It just depends on what you're doing. So you could save weight if you, uh, if you use your pneumatics wisely. Um, it can be installed uh, indefinitely without damage. Uh, it's resistant to impacts in direction of motion. So what that means is if you're extending your cylinder and you get hit right on the, on the top of it, it's not gonna, it's not very easily gonna, you know, it's not gonna mess up. It's not gonna like retract super easily. Whereas if you hit a motor, it's gonna be a lot, uh, you, there's a lot more that can go wrong. So it's just, it's just better in some situations to have a pneumatic cylinder with a ton of pressure behind it. Um, it's simple. Uh, it's much easier to mount than motors. Motors can be very difficult to mount, whereas cylinders are very, very simple to mount. Um, it's simpler than a rack and pinion situation. So if you need linear motion um, versus nonlinear motion, uh, cylinders can be a lot easier versus having to have a motor and gear situation that can have, there's a lot that can go wrong there. Uh, so now we're going to talk about, a little bit about the limitations of pneumatics. So you have limited range of motion. So cylinders are either all the way in or all the way out. So you don't really get a lot of like, you can't like go in between, let's say. So with a rack and pinion, maybe if you only wanted to extend halfway out, you could do that. But with pneumatics, you can't. You're either the piston's all the way in or it's all the way out. There's no, there's no in between. Um, you can have special valve and control systems to overcome that, though. So you can do that. Uh, pneumatics is prone to leaks. So you have to, you have to test your air system and kind of get that figured out. Otherwise, if you're leaking out on the field, well, that's going to become an issue. You're not going to be able to use any of your actuators because, well, you have a leak in your system. And if you lose pressure, well, then you're not going to have any flow and that's going to cause issues. So you need to make sure everything is secure, especially when you're dealing with like uh, the pneumatic tubing, right? The pneumatic tubing and those soft, like the, the soft press in uh, fittings where you slide the tube in, those are prone to leaks. They can, they're pretty buggy. So you have to make sure that those are secured and can't be damaged. Uh, you have limited air budget. So you have to, when you actually build your robot, you need to figure out how much air you're going to need out on the field and put an appropriate amount of storage on your robot. Um, but uh, if you're using your air a lot, well, you're going to run out. And sometimes it takes a while to refill your air system. And I know some years, uh, FRC allowed offboard compressors so you can fill up your air tanks and keep your compressor off of your robot to save weight and um, that's especially important because if you don't have a compressor you can't you can't uh, refill your air station or air tanks when you're out on the field so that's why that's important um, pneumatics can be difficult to interface with sensors so I'm sure many of you are familiar with being able to control motors with encoders, correct? Um, it's a lot harder to do those kinds of things with sensors. So you can't really, you know, you know, if you only want to extend it so far, it's hard to do that kind of stuff with a sensor because there's really no encoders, you know, stuff for, for pneumatics. Uh, limited rates of airflow, you know, so speed is kind of a, another issue, right? You're not going to, you're kind of stuck with, you know, how fast your cylinder can extend. You're, you get a certain speed and you can make it go slower with restriction valves and things like that. But um, if you need it to go any faster, well, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work that way. You, you kind of get it as fast as it can go right out of the box. And then FRC has a lot of rules and limitations that they implement. And those are usually pretty strict. So now we're going to talk about wise uses of pneumatics in FRC. So you would use pneumatics where motors can't provide the same results. And one of the big things is 
um, one of the big things is power. So pneumatics can provide a lot of power. And if it's like a vulnerable area of the robot, you might want to use a cylinder as opposed to a motor. Because if it can get hit a lot, you might not want that that play. So you a, a cylinder would be a great option there. And that kind of brings us number two, right? Where, where large forces are required over a short distance. So if you need a ton of force and with no play or no resistance, well, pneumatic cylinders can provide you with a ton of force. Um, the third one says, uh, use with linkages and mechanisms to provide mechanical advantage. So you could, ha you could have a, a cylinder driving a lever or something like that. Um, so that would uh, so that'd be kind of nice. And then it's always budget your air, make sure that you've got the correct amount of storage on there. Okay, so everybody attending, here's a question. If I have a mechanism and all I'm gonna do is go forward and come back, is that a good use of pneumatics or would I use a motor? Mm, what I'd say there is, it depends. So it's, if you're only using one, if you only need it for one thing, I. I'd say try to do the motor. See, what I think about pneumatics is if you're going to do one thing with pneumatics, you want to do as much as you can with pneumatics because pneumatics can be heavy. So, because you have to have the entire system on there. Right. So anyone got any questions about that? So I want to hear from anybody else on here. If I have a single motion and it's only one thing on the robot that I need to bring an arm forward and back, is it better to use pneumatics or a motor? Does anyone have an opinion on that? Don't be shy. This is your time to ask questions as we explain what pneumatics is. Some people are answering with pneumatics. Yeah, it all depends on what you need. I mean, sometimes maybe you have to use pneumatics. It just depends on what your situation is. Right. So if we have a single motion on there and everything else is servo driven on there, we got motors, uh, window motors, we have a little sparks there running this little throttle motor or something. And the choice is to add a cylinder. Does it pay to add the, all the components, which we're going to show you in a minute? So it's a little more than just adding an air cylinder on there and a valve. So if there's no questions or you're still thinking about that, if you have a question, just shout it out any time or use a chat window. So we'll go to the next screen and we'll explain over the the basics of the pneumatic system. So go ahead, Jared. Right. Okay, so this is kind of just uh, what a pneumatics test board would look like. And um, on the top picture, that long black tube, that is the storage tank. And you can put many of those on your robot. Um, so for the test board, they just have one there, but that's where the air is stored. Uh, below that, that is the compressor. So the compressor is what takes the air and compresses it and it puts it in that storage, uh, that storage tank. Um, to, just to the right of the storage tank with that gate, that has, there's a little thing with a gauge on it. That's the regulator. So that's going to take your high pressure, which is normally 120 PSI, and that's going to turn it down to a working pressure, which is 60 PSI. So that's just, that's just to regulate the pressure and make sure that it's constant and so everything is working the same no matter what your pressure is in the tank. Um, next to that, you have a solenoid valve. That's the air switch. So it's got a electromagnet in there that switches the airflow on and off. And then it controls where, which direction the cylinder is, if it's in or out. And the cylinder is right next to that, to the right there. And so that's going to have a metal arm in it that extends out when pressure is put behind it. And then when the solenoid is switched off, the pressure then drains through back through the solenoid and it retracts the arm. Um, and then the other components on there, there's a pressure switch. That's the other component with the two wires coming off of it right there. Um, that is to shut the compressor off once the pressure of 120 PSI is reached. They have a pressure gauge on there again, just to see where their high pressure is. And then there's a, a valve next to that just to drain your air system when you shut it off or when you're done using it. Uh, the bottom picture has the compressor, the pressure switch, and the, and the solenoid on it, but the big component outlined in green, that is going to be your 
pneumatics control module. So that's the electronics that controls your pneumatic system. So your compressor is wired to it. Your pressure switch is wired to it. Your solenoids are wired to it. Um, so that's going to control everything with your pneumatics. You're going to use that. Right. So getting back to our question we threw out there a moment ago, if I have to add a one cylinder on here to do a single motion, again, the question is, would I use a servo or do we want to use pneumatics? Now, this is the design consideration I want you guys all pay attention to. Now you see the picture on the screen. Look at all the components we have to add if we want to add one cylinder. Is it worth to put that on there? The tank, the compressor, and all the pneumatics with the cylinder, the switch, add more electrical with the pressure gauges and all that, and the dump valve. Don't forget the dump valve right here is the quick release to drain the system out. So in this case, you may not want to add a, a single cylinder on there. So when you're designing your robot and going through your beginning phases of a design or your robot, consider these different components. Do I have space on my robot? Is it worth it for one cylinder? Maybe I want to eliminate a couple motors and use more pneumatics. So I want everyone to understand the difference here. So they add one cylinder, everything you see on the screen has to be added to your robot. So just think about that. Any questions on that? The question, what is the best way to wire your compressor to the PCM? The wires are too big to fit as well. Great question. And you see that a lot. And I do control system advisory at a lot of the events. Some of you have seen me, some of you haven't. But one of the things is if you get the wrong size ferro in here, you can damage these quick press and release on here for the terminals on here. So you gotta be really careful because a lot of these will run an 18 gauge wire, especially the cylinders and stuff. The compressor is what uh, the Jesse is pointing out is the thicker wires and they're very difficult if you don't get them right when you put the ferrules and stuff on there to put them inside these terminals. I, I wish the manufacturer would make a little bigger terminals considering the current load on these compressors. And that's really what the question is, right? And you jam them in there. So if you make a good ferrule connection, which we've talked about in our electrical presentation in the previous week, go back and watch on YouTube if you want, um, you gotta make a proper ferrule connection because we recommend using ferrules on there. But again, you gotta be careful and you're right. It can be where you can jam them in there. They're spring loose, so if you do good square ferrule, you can usually just push them in there. But pay attention to your ferrule sizes on that. So you see on there, the, the compressor goes right in there and it's controlled by the pneumatic control module, right off the CAN bus to the robo reel. So great question. Any other questions on that? So I hope everyone's starting to see the thing. If I want to add one cylinder, you may or may want to use a servo versus a uh, pneumatic cylinder. So let's go on to the next slide and we're any questions. And we're just gonna break down a little more what's on the pneumatic control module. Yep, so this is the pneumatic control module. Um, on the top there, outlined in green, that's the CAN bus. So you, that's where you put your communication line. So you have the green and yellow wires. So you plug those into that. Um, next to that, both of the purple blocks, those are your solenoid channels. So that's where you're going to plug in your solenoids. The black wire goes into the black port and the red to its red port. And I believe there is eight ports, zero through seven. Um, so yeah, you can have up to seven solenoids on one PCM. Uh, you have your compressor output in orange. So that's where your compressor is plugged into. Uh, next to that in yellow, you have your pressure switch input. So that's going to shut the compressor off. Um, you have your solenoid voltage jumper. You can have 12 volts or 24 volt solenoids. And it's important to make sure that you're using all 12 or all 24 volt solenoids. You can't have both of them on the same PCM. So you have to figure out which ones you're going to use and then make sure that you set that to the correct voltage. And then you have your power supply, uh, 12 volt power supply port there. So that's, that's all the ports on the PCM. So here's a question. And I, I wanna go back to Jesse for a moment. Uh, the, Jesse, do you have any suggestions on that? I know where you're going with that because 
I don't like to change the, the gauge, wire gauge size coming off the compressor to fit them into these terminals you see on here. Have you done anything different with that? Uh, we've changed the wire gauge size. Um, we've uh, tried to cram them into ferrules that fit in there well, but they don't ever seem to really fit well. Exactly. If there was, if like CTRE or somebody made a jumper that fit yes. that well and then had screw terminals for the wire, I mean, they yep. could sell thousands of them probably right. i don't well, know why yeah. he hasn't done that i thought maybe it was out there and i just didn't know about it but maybe we should ask andy when he had the first session there about that the, from the compressors because they sell the compressor size and stuff on there but yeah they're exactly right and you know you never want to derate something that they put a higher gauge on there for the compressor because then th you know you know the compressors run hot when they're running and you just worry about that. And you wonder what CTRE is really thinking about that terminal on there. I've questioned for years myself. Okay. Okay, so, next uh, we're gonna talk about the uh, pneumatic control module function and how kind of some wiring tips and whatnot. Um, so- So Jake, let's ask, let's ask the question, oh. Jake. So you, oh. you, we have it on the screen here. Can I use 12 volt? voltage coils and 24 volt coils on my robot design. They want yeah, to I answer? believe you have to have two PCMs then. Right, but let's ask, let's ask the question to the audience. Does anyone know? Now's your time. So if this is your first year in robotics or first time looking into Max, you would not know the answer to this. This is another thing I've run across. I'm sure Jesse's ran across it before doing his different things with FTA and all that, but you cannot use mismatch with one PCM module. Why, Jake? Uh, so if you're running your PCM on a, with 24 volts and you plug a 12 volt solenoid in there, you're going to burn out your solenoid. And I guess the opposite goes for the 24 plugged into a 12 volt PCM. I mean, it's just not going to work. It's just not going to, the solenoid's not going to do anything. Right, so the jumper will tell us which one you're using. So the key point here is, before you start putting all these uh, valves on there, make sure you pay attention to the coil voltage and it'll be right on the side of the module. You'll be able to see it, it'll say it right there. And if not, look up the manufacturer's specifications on it by the part number. But you cannot miss and match. You can put two PCM modules on there a lot of times uh, first has allowed, allowed us to use more than one uh, pneumatic control module on there. So you could have some 24 volt and 12, but you need to have two modules for it. You can run one with 12 and one is 24 volts. Okay. Um, let's see what else. Uh, the PCM has specified ports for the compressor and the pressure switch. So that just means, you know, plug the compressor into the compressor port and uh, the pressure switch into the pressure switch port. Yes. So is the compressor automatically run when you turn the system on? Anyone know the answer to that? So again, if this is your first time looking at pneumatics, you wouldn't know the answer to it. So what's the answer, Jake? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does automatically turn on. And what point does it shut off? It shuts off when the pressure switch reads 120 PSI in your system. Correct. And that's all set by that, the sensor that's provided by FIRST that is wired into that port. The firmware takes care of all that. There's no programming for that. What happens if you plug um, a 12 volt coil into the 24 volt spot? What I've seen, it works sometimes and eventually it stops working because you can burn out that voltage, the, the actual coil on there. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, next we're gonna talk about the uh, compressor. So this is on the top there, you can see the model number, 120 pound uh, compressor. Uh, it weighs two and a half pounds, uh, it has a max current draw of 11 amps, built for a 9% duty cycle. And then at the bottom there, you can see the schematic symbol for a compressor. So that's for your electrical team, if they're drawing up a schematic for your electrical. 
Okay, next we're gonna talk about the pressure relief valve. So what this does is this will open up the, uh, this will open up your airline if you reach 120, or if you go over 120 PSI. So this, this is a safety thing. So if for some reason the pressure switch doesn't shut off and the thing keeps running, the pressure relief valve is gonna start dumping air. And you need to install this to, right next to the compressor with hard fittings, which means you can't have like air tube connecting to it. It has to be screwed in with the brass uh, hard fittings. Um, if you're using an offboard compressor, you need to have two of these. You need to have one on the robot and one on your, on your air filling station. So that's, a, again, it's just a safety thing to make sure that you're not going over 120 PSI. Yep, so important note, if you go through inspection, those that have not gone through a inspection at a regional event or districts, if you're in the type of the uh, region that has districts, the row inspectors usually will check this and all they test is they'll bypass, they'll jumper between the pressure switch so it doesn't tell the control to shut the compressor off and the spare be set correctly to release the pressure, I'll still help you. Okay, next we have the compressor setup. So on the left, you can see this is what it should look like with your pressure relief valve properly installed. So it should be installed with those hard fittings um, right next to the compressor. And then coming off of that, you should have one of those soft air tube connectors, which we'll get into those a little bit more. Um, this is the pressure switch. So this will shut off your compressor once you reach the proper pressure of 120 PSI. And this needs to be wired back to the pneumatic control module. Okay, these are the reservoirs. So this is where your high pressure air is gonna be stored. So this is gonna be the next thing right off the compressor. It's gonna go right to this. Um, these have a capacity of 574 cubic milliliters. Uh, they have a maximum working pressure of 125 PSI. So you can't go over that or you'll damage them. And then uh, let's see, okay, the rules allow for more than one of these, um, but the number varies each year. So you have to read, you got, it's important to read the manual because uh, pneumatics is very strict. So you need to make sure that you've read the manual and you know how many of these you can have on your robot. Okay, next are gauges. So you need at least two of them, one for your stored pressure and one for your working pressure. Uh, so one of those is gonna be installed somewhere before the regulator and the other one is usually installed on the regulator, which we'll look at a assembly of the regulator a little bit later so you can see what that's supposed to look like. Um, the stored, yeah, so the stored pressure gauge can be stored anywhere or put anywhere upstream of the working pressure. Uh, and the uh, working pressure gauge is installed right on the regulator. There's a third port for it, so it makes it nice and easy. Okay, then next we're gonna talk about regulators. So what these do is they decrease your storage pressure down to the working pressure. So that's gonna be the pressure that's, that's driving your cylinders. And um, it, it, I don't think it's changed much in the manual, but you just wanna make sure every year, it's usually 120 working and or sorry, storage and 60 working. So this is what takes that 120 PSI and turns it into 60. And there are arrows on it to indicate the in and out of the regulator. So you wanna make sure that you have that hooked up correctly. And then you attach the gauge to the back. And this is what that looks like. So the gauge will go on the back, it'll be screwed in. And then you have those soft press uh, fittings on the left and the right. Yep. Pay attention to the arrow on there. It won't work as the way it's supposed to. You plumb them up wrong. It's pretty obvious right away. Any questions about what we've covered so far? No questions? Shout them out anytime if you have them. Okay, uh, next is solenoids. So these are your, these are your, like your switches. These are gonna direct the flow of air to a certain area, like a, like a, usually it's for cylinders. So you would uh, direct the flow of air to extend a cylinder or retract a cylinder. 
uh, you need to have solenoids at the same voltage. So like, like we said before, you, you decide whether you want 12 or 24. And if for some reason you need both, you have to use two separate pneumatic control modules. And they're wired to the uh, solenoid ports on the PCM. Uh, next is cylinders. So cylinders are the actual, like the, the actual things that are getting things done, right? So cylinders are like the motors of pneumatics and you can use them to push or pull something. You need to make sure that you take into, like when you're designing your robot, you need to take into consideration the stroke length and so you have to determine how much reach you need. And then you make sure that are using, you're using cylinders that are first legal. So that goes back to reading that manual, making sure that you know what you can and cannot use. Um, on the top there, you can see the cross cut of what a cylinder looks like on the inside. So the air is gonna come in and it's gonna push the cylinder forward when you direct that flow of air. And then when you switch it off, it's gonna, the flow of air is gonna go the other way and it's gonna push it back down. Um, so you need to determine the inside diameter from the specifications. You need to know the diameter of the plunger. Um, the area going out is greater than the area going in. So you gotta make sure you, you look all this stuff up when, you, uh, when you're designing your robot. Uh, you can use bleeder valves to adjust the particular lines to reduce pressure. So that's, that's a speed thing. So if you, if you buy those valves and you put them in with the cylinder, you can control how fast they extend or retract. So what happens, and I don't want you to answer this right away, Jake, but what happens if you turn your system on and your cylinder fires when you first come on without actuating the, the solenoid? So meaning no voltage on the solenoid or on the solenoid, and your valve moves, so your cylinder moves out when you first power your system up. What's you the problem? What happened? Oh, well, you, you hooked you it up answer. backwards. Hey, yeah, Jake, I want the rest of the people to Oh, I thought you said you wanted me to answer it. No, so oh. you're correct, but did everyone catch that? Do right. you know it was the same? So you power up and your cylinder fires and you haven't turned on the solenoid. What is the issue? And how can you resolve it? It's very important to understand this. This happens to me all the time here at work sometimes. The mechanical tech will put the airlines on the wrong way. So if you look at the diagram on the lower left there, it's got the red line there going to the piston there, and they have a blue line on there, which is being exhausted when it comes back and tracks, right? So we turn it on. In this case, we want voltage to come on to the solenoid, which will open the gate inside and let air flow out pushing the cylinder forward. If you reverse them lines, that's what's gonna happen. It's gonna push it out right away without it. So you gotta pay attention to the ports on these cylinders. And this is where um, some people get frightened about pneumatics is understand the ports on these solenoids. So pay attention, look at the air diagrams, grab a mentor, look it up. And there's always help out there to figure out that. And a lot of times they put like they call a muffler on there where the blue arrows showing uh, those exhausting going on there, and that just kind of muffles the sound. So if anyone's got questions, let us know. Okay, uh, next we have uh, types of actuators. So you have the single action spring return. So that's just, you know, your air extends, or your air extends it, and then when you get rid of the air, the, a spring will pull it back instead of uh, air pressure doing it. And then you have the double action where the air pressure extends and returns. So the pressure is just switched from pushing it forward to, uh, to uh, pulling it back in. Okay, next uh, we're gonna talk about tubing. So this is what you would use to transport air to different areas of your robot. Um, so the, the standard tubing for FRC has an outer diameter of one quarter inch and an inner diameter of 0.16 inches. Um, what you want to make sure you do is you want to make sure you cut it with the tool. And I provided a picture of the tool right below the tubing there. And that's just to make sure that you cut the tubing square. And if you don't cut it square, it's going to leak possibly. So you need to make sure that you're using the special tool to cut the, cut the tubing. Right, so if I take it, unhook it from the 
the connector fitting on there because I need to do something or take a cylinder off, would I push that back in? How many people on the, on the presentation here watching would just remove it off the fitting and put it right back in? How many people would just do that? Anybody? You're all quiet. Would you just take it off the fitting? So if we um, go to the next slide quick here, you see these blue fittings right here on top here? The airline plugs into that. And if I had to do some maintenance on there and I pushed in and then pulled the line out, would you just plug it right back in? How many people would do that? Karen says no. Anybody else? No one else wants to answer? What do you say, Jake? Well, I was going to say you want to leave a little bit of extra length on your tubing so that if you do have to take it apart, you would always recut it. You always recut it to make sure that you have a fresh, uh, a fresh connection and it's not going to leak. So Absolutely. You always recut it. That's our recommendation. So just like when I tell the students we're going to pull wires and to our motors and all that, we always leave a little extra so it's not real tight and that you can rework it if you need to. Connector gets damaged or whatnot, we have enough without running a new wire. In this case, new in the Mac line, but also what Jake is saying is when you press in there, it's a tight fit and it's supposed to squeeze in there. So you push it in and you can pull back and it'll be tight unless you push that in and the blue knob there to release the pressure. And it's good practice to cut it back off and use the tube cutter so you don't cut it at some weird angle and stuff and then you start having poor performance in the field. Yep. Um, these pictures are of the different kinds of uh, fittings you can use. The top picture is the soft fittings. So those are what you would plug the tubes into. Um, just to insert them, it's just simple. You just push them in all the way until they stop. And then you would pull back to make sure that they are in nice and tight. And then to release them, you push down on the blue collar and then you can pull the tube out. And then, like we said before, recut the tube it, when you reinsert it. Um, you can use these to divide your air. So there's different kinds. You can, you, there's like the Y connector. So to split one airline in, into two, and there's the T style ones where you have one airline coming in and it can divert into two ways perpendicular. And then there's the 90 degree fittings. And that's just probably for, uh, you know, if you need to get around a corner or something and you don't want to have your tube scraping on a sharp edge, you would use that. On the bottom, we have the brass fittings. So those are the hard fittings. And those are for things like the, uh, for like the relief valve and your gauges and pressure switches. So that's what those are for. And when you connect those, you need to make sure that they're wrapped in Teflon tape, which we'll have a slide on that explaining what Teflon tape is. And what Teflon tape does is it seals those threaded fittings and it's just a special tape. You wrap it around it and then you thread them together. Um, when you wrap it, you need to wrap it in the opposite direction that you thread the uh, fitting in. Otherwise, it'll unwind the tape and it will get all bunched up. So you need to make sure that you're wrapping in the opposite direction that you thread the thread or the fitting in. Okay, so some tips for fittings. Like I said before, you use the Teflon tape. Uh, you need to leave at least one thread showing so that's so that you can actually start the thread. Uh, if you wrap the whole thing in tape, it's going to make it very difficult to thread in. Uh, you need to use a tube cutter to make clean cuts so that it doesn't leak. Uh, fittings are tapered, uh, national pipe thread fittings, so don't over torque them. Uh, let's see, sizing. Uh, consider how often your actuators fire. So that'll help you determine how much air you're going to need. Uh, add up volume of air used each time. So that's another thing. So you, you need to make sure you have enough air to get you through a match. Uh, compare amount stored and generated. So, you know, make sure you're, that you're generating enough if you have an onboard compressor so that you don't run out and you're not going to have enough time to resupply your air. Questions? 
things we have missed. So as you're thinking of questions here, let's recap again at the beginning. If I wanna use a single cylinder onto a manipulator, actuator, or do something, right? I wanna extend it, I wanna move something, maybe it's an arm to pick up a game piece, or I wanna use it as a claw to grip something when I pick up that game piece. Sometimes is it more out to use a servo motor on there or a cylinder to do the action? So design considerations. What do we need on the robot if we need to add pneumatics to it? Can you name off some of the components we need for that if we want to add on it? Remember, if I want to add a motor, I just need to put that a uh, spark, uh, a neo on there. I could put on uh, a talon on there to drive whatever motor, 77 Pro. I can use the throttle motors. I can use a sim motor, a mini sim, a bag motor, all this stuff on here. It's two components on there. What do I need if I'm gonna add pneumatics to my robot? So who can name a few? No one wants to name any components of a pneumatic system if I'm going to use that as a design consideration. So I'm first saying the gauge, regulator, solenoids, good. What if I have all 24 volt solenoids in my stock? What do I need to consider or make sure I do on my robot to make it work? Nope, 24 volt coil. So what do I need to make sure? What about the PCM? What do I need to pay attention to in the PCM? The voltage, so how do I do that? You can speak too, it might be easier just to tell us. You're right on the voltage, but we, we're looking for something very particular here. What do I need to make sure on the PCM? Because this one stung a lot of people at regional events. I've, I've even seen it at Champs before. My solenoid is not working, why? Anybody? Right, okay. So we can go back to the presentation there. It's very important, you just can't stress that enough on there. There's a jumper on here, so the main point would be the jumper, right? Let's go back to it again. Oh, I flew right by it. This jumper right here, you need to make sure that's in the right location. So the picture shows you right now, right position is it in right now? If you look at the picture, it might be a little hard to see, but you should probably see it. Can I use a 24 volt coil solenoid with this current configuration? And everyone's answer should be obviously, anybody? If I'm using 24 volt coils on my solenoids, will this current jumper configuration work? A lot of yeses, but the answer is actually no. So let's pay attention to where this is right here. See this? The jumper's right here. So it might be a little difficult to see on this picture here, but you'll see the jumper is in the 12 volts. So it's the left. If I was using 24 volt coils, I need to take this jumper, lift it out of there and move it one pin to the right. Everyone see that? Very, very important because it stings a lot of people when we, we see this at the regionals where their pneumatics ain't working. Might be a little closer to see on this bigger diagram, but see this is in the 12 volt position. So if I was gonna use 24 volt coils on my solenoids, this position that it's currently configured will not work. Make sure everyone sees that. Okay, everyone understand that? We good? Yes? Awful quiet. 
Okay, here's another question for you. Now you've been through the pneumatic class here and we we're just touching the surface on uh, pneumatics 101 here. Here's another question for you. How can I test to see if my pressure release is set correctly? The pressure relief valve, how can I test to make sure I've set this up correctly before I get the inspector, a robot inspector to my pit to inspect my pneumatics? Anyone know how we can test that? Okay, John says jumper the release gauge wiring and fire the compressor. Does everyone agree with that? Could you turn off the pressure switch? Can't, uh, you can't turn it off, okay. but you can jumper it. So a lot of teams will just have a jumper wire with two alligator clips on it, right? Some people use a screwdriver and they hold the screwdriver between the two terminals on there. And we can go to the slide and show you on there. But you want to make sure you're pretty close on that because you will not pass inspection if you don't have this set right. So on this picture here, see these two lugs right here? And we would take wires and we would use an eyelet uh, connector on there and put it on there or a fork. And we want to make sure this is a tight connection. Because if this wire comes loose during the competition that and it doesn't shut off, your compressor will keep running and then your relief valve will be going off in the middle of the match. So we, got, we want to make sure that we understand all this on here, right? So take an alligator clip and you would uh, clip on each side of that or take a screwdriver and short that out. Once the pressure hits, what pressure will this relief valve go off? Because we'll be looking at the pressure gauge, right? So what pressure does that relief valve open up and let air out? There we go. Karen's saying 120, does everyone agree? 125. One twenty. One thirty. Someone says. One twenty. One twenty. What is it, Jake? One twenty. One twenty is usually what uh, everything's designed for. One twenty. So when it, when one hundred twenty. 120 pounds of pressure on that regulator, that relief valve should open up. And everyone should be testing this when they use pneumatics. I encourage you to do that and walk through it with all your students, um, all your leaders of that group, and uh, make sure everyone understands that, especially the person that's gonna be doing the inspection that is gonna be in the pit with the robot inspector. Okay. The tanks and stuff on there, you know, when you do design considerations, you got to look at mounting them and stuff. And usually everyone wants to use the Max, but they can't fit in the robot. So I've seen clever ways of they're doing it on the side, they build the bottom of it. You know, the compressor is a little heavier. So um, compressor placement is really critical as well when you're designing your robot overall, right? If you're gonna do a climbing application or you're you know, climbing up on stuff or going up on ramps in some of these games where you're doing an incline, you know, if you put the battery and your compressor back there, you might be really close to tipping over. So you wanna balance your robot and place your compressor and your batteries in a nice location in your robot. But, you know, it's a 2.4 pounds, I think we've put in our presentation there. You know, just pay attention to the placement of that, right? Now, the other important thing when you design your robot is the cutoff, the valve that opens up and releases the pressure. If you can't easily get to it, your, the robot inspector coming to your pit will also have you change that location. I must have flew by again on the presentation here. Second here, we'll go back. Where to go? There's a valve that opens up. I totally lost where it's at. Must be at the beginning. Okay. 
So on this picture here, you see the, it's got the pressure switch on there, the regulator, which is, which regulator is this? The working pressure or the actual pressure store? Anybody know? Of course, this will be your actual pressure. The pressure is gonna be stored here. Right to the right of this, if this valve, that's a ball valve here that turns, right now it's open, you can see it's in line with it. This has to be accessible and the gauge has got to be so the FTAs, the field personnel can see that. And if there's an issue to your robot and they need to release the pressure on here, you need to be able to get to that. So if it's not easily accessible, a lot of times the robot inspector will make you move it. So be aware of that, that that valve needs to be out close. Um, facing out so you can easily get to it. So don't hide it between um, some bunch of lax and that guarding your robot. Just be pay attention to that. And then the other one is the working pressure on this side. Again, that should be at a 60 PSI unless first changes the rules at some point, but most of the time it's 60. So that's just some more tips on that, on using the Maddox. It's important. Um, sometimes it's get complicated. People don't quite understand different things on here. But what you're seeing on this diagram is a basic setup on how to wire it and configure it for your robot. And is there any last questions as we wrap up here? We're at the end of the time here. Any last questions? I didn't really introduce myself, but I am uh, the lead mentor for 7068. And I also do control system visors for the system so all during the regionals and stuff that we kind of mentioned, but um, good luck to anybody. If you have any questions, you can contact us and stuff. This video will be posted on our Jumpstart Robotics uh, website and our YouTube channel next week. So if you need to go back and review some things, you're more than welcome. You can shoot us an email, questions or not, or other mentors around the area. And good luck using the Maddox. All right. Uh, thanks, Tom.